Hey, I'm Miranda Cosgrove, and this is part two of my favorite episodes of Science Minute with Minute Earth, an illustrated segment from my show, Mission Unstoppable. Wait, let me animate myself. This is a bald eagle, and it's a bit of a fraud. No, not like that. It's totally a real bird, but when it's on TV, it lip syncs. Here's what I mean. Whenever you see one of these guys soaring majestically across the screen, it's usually accompanied by this fierce scream. But that's no eagle. That sound is actually the work of a voice actor known as the red-tailed hawk. Why is that? Well, when we think of bald eagles, we think of strength and courage and determination. You know, America. But in reality, the eagle's call is less majestic and more, well, cackly. Here, listen for yourself. <laughs> Old Hollywood movie producers realized that in order to preserve the bird's symbolic value, they needed to give its voice a makeover. Thus, the bird and switch. <laughs> You've heard of ant farms, but did you know that ants farm? It's true. In the forests of South America, columns of leafcutter ants scurry along tree branches collecting, well, leaves. But they don't actually eat the leaves. Instead, they do something much weirder. They carry the foliage underground to their home where they feed it to a fungus. This fungus, which only exists in leafcutter ant dens, is basically an ant crop, just like humans grow corn. And just like human farmers love to munch on corn, ant farmers love to snack on their shrooms. Ants aren't the only fungal farmers in the animal kingdom. Termites, ambrosia beetles, and even snails do it too. Meanwhile, spotted jellies farm algae, and yeti crabs use their hairy arms to grow colonies of tasty bacteria. Most impressively, the long thin damselfish herds swarms of seemingly domesticated shrimp like an underwater cowboy. It turns out that animal farms are far more common than we thought. People come from all around the world to admire this giant stone structure in the English countryside, now known as Stonehenge, which was built thousands of years ago by some particularly industrious folks who dragged huge boulders for miles in order to make it. And there have been a lot of theories about why they built it. Like, maybe it was a temple for important religious ceremonies, or a meeting place for rival chiefdoms, or a cemetery for VIPs. One enduring theory suggests that Stonehenge was basically used as a giant calendar. For instance, if you're standing in the center of the rings on the first day of summer, the sun seems to rise behind a particular stone called the heel stone, meaning that people probably use Stonehenge to track the passing of the seasons. But that seems like a lot of work to just make the world's biggest sundial. Perhaps the true purpose of Stonehenge has been lost to the thing we think it tracked, time. Hey, up here! I'm on top of one of the tallest skyscrapers on the planet. It's a good thing I'm not afraid of heights. When buildings get this high, their biggest problem is the wind. Early skyscrapers would sway nauseatingly whenever it was gusty outside. That's because when lots of air gets pushed up against a building, it can create powerful whirlwinds that spin off of the corners and tug the structure from side to side. So modern skyscrapers, like this one, have a secret weapon called a damper, which is basically a giant weight connected to a wind monitor. When the wind really starts blowing, the weight shifts to counteract the force of the wind and keep the building from swaying. Many of the tallest buildings in the world have a damper, but the tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, at over a half mile tall, was instead designed to be thin and aerodynamic. Basically, it slices through the wind like a wing, so the air can't pile up in the first place. Speaking of wings, it's time for me to fly. <laughs> Spiders, they're on the ground, in the sky, oh yeah, they fly, lurking in your bedroom closet, and guess what? They're also all over your face. Yep, these teeny tiny arachnids are called demodex, and they're actually mites that live inside our pores. This news may be sending a shiver down your spine, but let me assure you, everybody has these on their face, and it's completely normal. Demodex are not visible to the human eye. They're 0.3 millimeters long. You'd need to line up five of them to fit on a pinhead, and let's be honest, you still couldn't see them. They spend their days inside our pores, eating our sebum, and come out at night to mate and lay their eggs. 
scientists say there's no need to be concerned, and we most likely have a symbiotic relationship with these little bugs, much like bacteria in our gut. If you want to view your own demo decks, just find someone with a high-powered microscope, scrape off some of your sebum, put it on a microscope slide, and say hello to your face spiders. Up in the Arctic Circle, buried in 400 feet of permafrost, lies a vault. A very special vault. It's not filled with money, or gold, or diamonds. This vault holds the world's largest collection of seeds. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault is home to almost one million seeds from nearly every country in the world. Scientists take great care in protecting these seeds as they protect the health of our planet. Think about it. If a disaster wipes out a crop like, for example, strawberries, the bank will be able to provide the seeds to replant strawberry fields. Because imagine a world without strawberry shakes. That's not a world I care to see. So not only is this an insurance policy for our food sources, the seed vault also maintains the genetic diversity of the crops on our planet. The vault's environment was built to keep the seeds safe for thousands of years. So your grandchildren's 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 grandchildren should all be able to enjoy that same delicious strawberry shake that we know and love. Oh no, you've cut yourself. That's all right though, because our skin has the ability to heal. It's pretty complicated though. The first stage is hemostasis, where the wound clots to stop bleeding. Next is the inflammatory stage, where healing and repair cells move in. Then to the proliferative stage, where new tissue is built. And finally, maturation, when your skin is remodeled. But I have something to tell you that might shock you. The skin that grows back is not the same quality as your original skin. It's actually only 80% as strong as your previous unwounded skin. So friends, be careful out there. This is a map of the Earth's time zones, and it mostly makes sense. Sure, there are a few weird jets and jags, but if we roll the map up into a cylinder and slowly rotate it next to a light source, like the Earth rotates near the sun, you can see that when Tokyo is getting bathed in light, New York is in the dark, so it makes sense that they should have very different time zones. But the Earth is not a hollow cylinder. It's a slightly squashed sphere, and at its poles, the Eastern Time Zone and Japan Standard Time Zone and all the other time zones smash into one another, so there's never any agreed-upon time at those two spots. Thanks to their locations, the poles only get one yearly sunrise and sunset anyway, so there's not necessarily an obvious time zone choice. Scientists at the South Pole Research Station have chosen a time zone based on convenience. They use New Zealand Standard Time, because that's where all their supplies come from. And, well, there's mostly just ice at the North Pole, and the only resident there keeps insisting there's no time like the present. If you like this, there's a ton more to see on the Mission Unstoppable YouTube channel. Or, if you're in the U.S., come watch the new season on Saturday mornings on CBS.